International Women's Day celebrates the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women. In honor of this special day, our show wants to spotlight these women. Every season, there will be one show we call Women Trailblazers. Tonight, we kick off this special episode with two women blazing a path in the fields of motivational speaking and entertainment law. I'm so happy you're joining us. From Los Angeles, this is KLCS PBS. Welcome to Everybody with Angela Williamson, an innovation, arts, education, and public affairs program. Everybody with Angela Williamson is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. And now your host, Dr. Angela Williamson. Our show starts tonight with Jenna Edwards. Jenna, it is such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for being here. Are you kidding? I'm so excited. Thanks okay. for having me. <laughs> My pleasure. Well, you know, you're here because not only are you a trailblazer, but you have this amazing story. So. I'm gonna put you on the spot and ask you to tell me all about it. <laughs> well, I always am like, which story? But I think I we've talked before, right? So my whole thing in the world is spreading this concept of aggressive optimism, which to me just means like, sometimes life's gonna kick you in the teeth. And when it does, you have to like grab onto this optimistic mindset because, you know, it's, it's difficult at those times. And I learned that in a really, severe almost way when I was in the Santa Monica farmer's market shopping, buying oranges, no big deal, right? Beautiful, sunny day. And a car came out of nowhere and <laughs> mowed down four blocks of people. And he killed 10 and injured over 60 of us. And he hit me at 60 miles an hour. And the man standing right next to me, like right here, didn't make it. So it was one of those moments, of course, where you're like, Whoa, that could have been me. George Weller, age 86, went out driving his 1992 Buick LeSabre down Arizona Avenue in Santa Monica, heading towards the city's Third Street Promenade. Due to a farmer's market that afternoon, the last few blocks of the street had been closed off to any traffic. However, George Weller's car is reported to have struck a 2003 Mercedes-Benz S30 sedan, which at the time had stopped to allow pedestrians over a crosswalk. He is said to have accelerated around a road closure sign, plowing through the barricades and into the busy marketplace, which was crowded with people. It's estimated that he was doing speeds of between 40 and 60 miles per hour, with the whole tragedy taking just 10 seconds to unfold. When his car finally came to a stop, around 63 people had been injured and sadly 10 people being killed. People were in complete shock at what they had just witnessed. What had been a lovely afternoon at the farmer's market was now a scene of chaos and devastation. And I think it's because I suffered really severe post-traumatic stress disorder from the event. I stuttered when I talked, I couldn't read. I would forget basic words when we were having a conversation. But that's important that you stuttered, you couldn't read because what was your job? <laughs> what was your job when you were at the farmer's market? Because a lot of people in Los Angeles, we remember that event. Yes. What was your job? I had literally like a month before been on the series finale of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Technically, I'm a slayer. I inherited her power, which is like the coolest thing ever for a Buffy fan, which I am. Um, and so I came out here from Minnesota and my dream had always been to be on television. And here I was on like one of my favorite shows. I thought my whole life was going to like begin and my career was going to take off. And then this event happened and I literally couldn't do the basic things it took, reading, speaking, <laughs> to be an actor. From now on, every girl in the world who might be a slayer will be a slayer. Every girl who could have the power will have the power. Can stand up, will stand up. And it took me three and a half years before I could like work again and function. And I was having 
like severe flashbacks on a daily basis that would like send me into panic attacks that would make me pass out from hyperventilation. Like it was really tough. And so I didn't realize it at the time, obviously, because I was in the trauma that, you know, you, you really do have to like surround yourself with things that remind you of the good, which is why I'm obsessed with yellow, by the way. <laughs> but um, so years later, I realized I had subconsciously been aggressive about this optimistic viewpoint during that whole period of my life because everything in my head was so dark mm -hmm. and, you know, just really awful. And so I was like, okay, what can I do? Like there's things that you can do Surround yourself with yellow, surround yourself with the things that make you happy, remind yourself that, you know, life can be good again. So that's essentially kind of the foundation of where I come from when I talk to people. <laughs> well, and then, I mean, all of a sudden one day you just come up with these, you know, aggressive optimism. <laughs> and, and so was that after looking at the steps that you had to take to get out of those dark days that you had? Or was it that you just had to turn your mind around to that? Um, I don't know that like aggressive optimism. I remember I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who was using the terms separately, but kind of together. And I, I didn't even remember that you know, conversation until he reminded me when I was like, hey, I'm going to start doing these speeches and <laughs> like write these stories about this thing I'm calling aggressive optimism. He's like, oh, that's like what we were talking about. And so I think like when you're in a community, especially like us, we get to be amongst all these amazing, creative, wonderful people who, you know, you have these conversations and like years later, you're inspired by them without realizing you're inspired by them. So I think that's how the, the terms came together. But um, yeah, I, I, it's short answer is that's how that happened. <laughs> and, and recently, because that term means so much to you, you actually took the steps to, did you trademark yes, it? Yes, I own the term aggressive optimism, which is like the trippiest thing ever. <laughs> Who gets to own a term? Well, yeah, apparently I do. Um, <laughs> and it was because of our, our co-author, Katie Jeffcoat, who's in the um, Inspired Impact series with us. She was trademarking something called intentional margins and yeah. she's a lawyer so she knew you could do that i was like you can do that and so we had this conversation and she's like yeah absolutely and i was just about it was pre-covid and i was doing high school speeches and that was what my like theme was and so i went ahead and trademarked it which is not an easy task so it's kind of like something i'm proud of i have it like all framed and yeah well I'm i won't a, make that my next dork. goal then if it <laughs> if it is a task i won't make that my next goal but I, I, I love because you, you had this term, you trademarked it because it, it's so successful. So my question to you, Jenna, is how can we use that in our life right now? Oh, wow, you really are putting me on the spot. You sent me like three questions and these were not it. But oh that's totally well, fine. who you are and what you do, so you're telling us <laughs> what you do and how to do it. I'm just you kidding. You call me out on television. I am <laughs> razzing you, I am kidding. No, um, it's, it's really, you know, my big thing is like figure out what works for you. So I have a real hard time with, with like the idea of frameworking certain like, psychological things. Okay. But I will say what has worked for me is when you're going through something, identifying because denial, like honestly, denial almost killed me. When I had PTSD, I was like, it's fine. I'm fine. I mean, I literally didn't sleep for eight months. Anytime I tried, people died in my head. Like it was horrible. Right. And I was like, oh, it's all good. It's all good. And I'm like, that is not the way to go, right? Yeah. So denial needs to go away and acknowledgement needs to come in its place. So sometimes the situation's really cruddy. Yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, sometimes I it's hard to acknowledge. So how, so how did you do that for yourself oh. based on that event? Whew. That was a whole thing. Like it's a whole traumatic story. Do you really want me to share? Because I'm happy to. Yes. So it was eight months that I didn't sleep. You said that. And I, and I also denied needing therapy. And like, so I was a mess. I was a mess. And 
I had finally given in to the idea, like I grew up in Minnesota, where very much pull yourself up by your bootstraps, get on with life, it's okay. And everybody around me was like, you should be so grateful you're alive. And when you say that to somebody who went through a traumatic event, it's not that I wasn't grateful, it was that like PTSD makes it so that you're crying all the time. Like your brain doesn't work the same way. The way it was described to me was so brilliant. It was like, we have fight or flight reflexes. And we're, we've evolved to the point where when we are in a traumatic event, we're not gonna beat somebody up mm -hmm. and we're not gonna run away. And so the chemical reaction in your body just sits there and it like totally changes the chemistry in your brain and your body. And until somebody explained that to me, I was like, oh, that's why I am so optimistic, but yet I'm crying all the time. Or I'm so optimistic, yet if a car backfires, I am on the ground having a flashback. Like, I can't control it. And so for me, it was this whole process of acknowledging it, but the acknowledgement came in a really horrific way. So I finally went to therapy, and they finally gave me sleeping medications. But let me tell you, it took like 15, 15 different medications to get the right thing. Like, it was... I was having reactions, all these things, and I was just feeling so hopeless and exhausted. Yeah. Like, you need sleep. <laughs> and yeah. So one day, I, um, and I say this like with a giggle, because to me, it's just so, I, I still can't believe I went through all of this, right? So I'm not trying to belittle it when yeah. I giggle, just so you yeah. guys know. Um, I've been called out on that before. Um, so one day, I literally was in my apartment, I'll never forget it, and I just wanted to sleep so badly that I, and my husband was my boyfriend at the time, thank goodness he stayed, I don't know how he did it, um, like I had gotten sleeping pills from the doctor, yes. he hid them, and I ransacked the entire house because I was going to take the entire bottle, <sighs> not because I wanted to die, but because I just wanted to go to sleep and it wasn't working. And in this moment of like <laughs> literally sitting in my living room with things like, like off the shelf, yes. my whole room was destroyed. Wow. I had this moment of like, you need to go to the hospital. Like this is not something you can do on your own anymore. And so I, you know, I checked myself into the psych ward and I asked for help and it was the first time that I slept. <laughs> like I remember sleeping that night and being like, oh, I'm better. <laughs> because like you were I, finally sleeping. I woke up the next day and I went to the therapist and I was like, I'm better. I can go home now. He's like, no. You were no, just no, no. starting yes. the process, but you, yes. in order to start that process, you had to acknowledge yeah. you needed something more yes. than what Jenna yes. and even the poor little boyfriend could give I you. Know. I don't know how he did it. Yes, exactly. And from that acknowledgement, you can then go, what are my options? Because, like, I have a very logical brain. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a producer. Yeah. We know. You, have, yes. you look at the situation, you're like, how do we get here? Mm -hmm. We're here, we get there. And so, for me, the getting there took about two years of like trying all these different things. So with aggressive optimism, it's like acknowledging where you are, understanding where you wanna go, but then being willing to try the things that you need to try to figure out how you can get there happily, right? <laughs> well, and, and I'm thankful, and thank you for going off script and explaining <laughs> that, because when people think optimism, they think I just have to be happy all the time. And, yeah. uh, and that's just, happiness is part of it. It's the journey to get there. Am I understanding what Jenna's mission is with this? Yes, it's, it's not necessarily always the journey to get yeah. there. It's more of just, how do I explain it? I'm so sorry, I'm not having an easy time explaining this, apparently. Um, it's figuring out how you can get there with joy, right? Like there's this term now called toxic positivity. Have you heard of this? No. And it, I'm like, yes, that's exactly because the Because that's problem. like, that's two opposites. So how do two op opposites come together to form it's that? It's that denial piece, right? It's that like, oh, if I'm just positive, if I'm just like constantly yeah. happy, but then you're in denial of the actual situation, which is what nearly killed me. 
right? Like, like being toxically positive and I'm, like, I'm fine, I'm fine, it's all good, everything's fine, when I was not fine, like physically not okay. Um, and so it's one of those things where like, yeah, we can't constantly be like sunshine and roses. Sometimes life is hard, but we have to constantly be like, yes, life is hard right now, but it's not gonna always be hard. That's the optimism, right? And you know what? That is a perfect way to end <laughs> our talk. Oh. This, I know. You were on <laughs> such so a roll. Fast. You didn't realize that. It, but you gave us so much in oh. that. And, and you allowed us to understand what it means so to, to have aggressive optimism. Yeah. So thank you so much for that. Thank, and thank you. you for telling us that when we find our joy, we can find a way to get out of that situation. 100%. So you are so perfect to start this show. Now I'm going to bring your other trailblazer on to finish this show. So thank you so much, Jenna. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And come back as I continue my Women Trailblazers conversation with Nadia Davari. When I was growing up, my mom was extremely tidy. We were trained to put things back where we got them from. One day, when I walked into my mom's house, I felt like I walked to someone else's house. There was stuff everywhere. And just growing up, the way I grew up, and to see this transition was very alarming. When Sean talked to me, it was a wake-up call, and that's when I went to the doctor. Nadia, thank you so much for being here on the show. You have done some amazing things in your business. Tell us a little bit about you and why did you choose entertainment law? Well, thank you for having me, Angel. Um, I, it always is a, a little shocking to hear somebody talk about me in that way because, you know, when you're practicing law or you're doing your work, as I'm sure you know, you're just trying to do the best you can and working your hardest and to actually feel that maybe you have helped some people and achieved some of your goals or most of your goals and are making a difference is always very um, satisfying, gratifying to hear. So I'm grateful for that. Well, Almost, and maybe because I know you a, a little, we've been friends for a little bit, and we've worked together, but I see Nadia more than an entertainment lawyer. I see someone who is passionate about what she does and passionate about your clients. And so where do you think that comes from? Because it's almost as if you, you are on a personal mission. That is very uh, true, and thank you for recognizing that. Um, I feel like, uh, Everything I do has a little piece of me in it. And I feel like my clients, I ha as an advocate, as an attorney, I have to advocate on their behalf and protect them. And um, that is my goal more than anything else. Um, I feel if you are, um, this is such a cliche and we hear it all the time, if you really love what you do and if you feel passionate about it, everything else will fall into place. Um, I have to, I have come to experience that. So it all comes from a, uh, again, and maybe another cliche, but, but from a place of love. You know, I, uh, when filmmakers come to me and they have 
their passion and the project they're working on that they've been wor uh, wanting to do for such a long time. They put in so much time into it. And sometimes their life savings or their friends and families or they've worked so hard to raise the financing and get the project together. I, I feel a part of that too. You know, I want to contribute. I want to help them get to where they want to go. And um, I feel privileged to be a part of their team. So each time it's like you're giving birth to something, you're creating something, something very positive and constructive, you know, and um, very uh, creative. I feel blessed to be doing what I do. And what I really, and this is the reason why you're in this episode, is as a trailblazer, because when people think about law, they think about, okay, I'm going to get this degree and get into the best law firm, but what I like that you've done is you've actually, you have your own law firm. And was that a difficult decision for you to start out on your own? Because it, I mean, you took a chance there and it's amazing. That's a really interesting question because um, I did start out like everyone else, you know, and I, that's invaluable. I can't say that you sh anybody should skip that. Um, uh, you know, of course, everybody has their own preferences, yes. but uh, the lessons you learn are invaluable. How to practice law, how to be a good lawyer, and different skills. The, the you know, just legal skills and other skills, uh, client interactions, and you learn from your peers and from your you know more experienced attorney. So there's no, I can't uh, knock that. And then of course there are different paths that you can take. You know. Um, that's a whole different discussion, but just to touch upon it, um, you can go into the law firm setting, you can go into the studio setting, you can go into the smaller production companies within the area of law that I practice, that is. So I did a little bit of all of that. And um, I got to a point where I had met uh, a lot of people and I had spent some time practicing law. So I had developed a network of people and um, some, uh, all of that. So I can't take all the credit for it, I oh. have to say. <laughs> You're being humble too. That's definitely a quality of a trailblazer. You're very humble. <laughs> I, I can't take uh, credit for that. But you know, I, um, I think you know, it's, what do they say? You have to do the hard work mm -hmm. and then hope that you're in the right place. The right, and so kind of all, many things have to come together. And I, and I would be a fool to take, a cre take credit for all of it, right? So, um, uh, so it got to a point where having had the network of people that I have known, it, the work kind of let its, uh, its lend itself to, you know, I became so busy where I wouldn't, I didn't have the chance to even go on interviews. Even, even as of like maybe two months ago, I had an offer to go work for a company. So there was another, again, I had to make that decision. Do I want to continue what I'm doing or do I want to go back into a company? You know, before that I had an offer to go to a big law firm uh, maybe about two years ago and then I had to make the same decision, you know. So while, as you discussed, you know, when did you decide to do it on your own and work with two other female attorneys yes. and uh, versus being in a company or in a law firm, that, that continues on, you know. You can still at any time kind of go back and do any of those things. And the question, it's, um, again, it's an interesting question of how you approach that. Yes, do I want the lifestyle? It's much more work and much more difficult, I think, to do what we're doing. I've noticed that at even though you do work with two other women, but it still is your own company. And you talk about being accessible. You don't really work Monday through Friday, nine to five. And, and so, I mean, that is dedication all in itself. You think that that's what makes you different from anybody else that's out there doing entertainment law because you have just this diverse list of clients, phenomenal clients. And they I think, choose you. And I th uh, well, I think uh, just being an attorney, you can't be nine to five. You know, it, it, that just doesn't exist. Practicing law, um, maybe for some people in certain situations, but on a whole, I can't say never. But on a whole, um, you know, uh, with majority of attorneys, that doesn't happen. 
And um, then within entertainment law, it's even less so, especially if, if one of your clients is going into production or something's happening to them, you know, it's a much more personal relationship. And um, you become the confidant, you know, almost. It's it's a counselor, you know, and um, and people come to rely on you. And, and I, I feel responsible. I feel, uh, you know, um, that I that that I have to take the best care that I can of my clients. So um, then by just the virtue of that, your 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 day or your work uh, time uh, expands to accommodate yes. that. But then the nature of the business is also one that, you know, it's really, there is no nine to five. There is no five days a week. It's really always on. I remember our joke, um, one time I was on TSA, you know, trying to get checked through the airport, and I was on the phone. TSA <laughs> made me hang off the phone, and of course, right afterwards, I was back on the phone. So it just never stops. It never ends. Well, before I end my conversation with you, and thank you so much for being on this special episode about women trailblazers. Where do you see Nadia going in this business with entertainment law within the next five years? So you had some changes, and so. Well, um, I wish I knew the answer to that. I mean, what am I? Yes. <laughs> what are my thoughts? Yeah. And um, I hope that I'm still lucky enough to be doing what I'm doing. Just that is a blessing. I hope that um, you know we take good enough care of our environments, that we are all healthy, and this pandemic kind of eases and um, we, are, uh, we can take care of each other and I can continue to do what I'm doing and maybe get on the uh, production side of some things. That's wonderful. You would be wonderful on the production side. Oh, we'll definitely have to keep in touch and talk about that because I can definitely see that in your future. I think entertainment lawyers, whether, you know, a lot of us do become involved, you know, you kind of, because you're helping clients and you wind up putting projects together without really putting projects together. Yes. So you kind of do become involved in that aspect a little bit too. That does make sense. Well, again, thank you so much for just sharing your time with us today and letting us know a little bit about entertainment law and why it's so important. You gave us so many wonderful examples. And definitely keep in touch with us on the show because we'd like to bring some of your clients back on the show too. It would as well. be my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me, Angela. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on Everybody with Angela Williamson. Viewers like you make this show possible. Join us on social media to continue this conversation. Good night and stay well. Mm -hmm.